Hello and welcome to Wit Writ in Brass Part 2. Uh, my name is Glenn Alexander and thank you very much for clicking on this video and being here with me today. Um, so if you haven't already seen Part uh, 1, may I recommend you go and watch that first, just so it makes some of the ideas in this video a little bit easier to comprehend. Um, so, uh, I expect to either be burnt at the stake for heresy or sanctioned for some of the things that I'm going to say in this um, video. But for me, it's really important that I speak the truth that I currently believe. Um, so, this video is to the infane lovers of truth, not my words. Um, yeah, so uh, get ready. So, before we begin... Um, if you're not already familiar with these figures from the art of English prosy, uh, metonymia, prosonomasia, hypotoposis, uh, prosopographia, prosopopeia, topographia, pragmatographia, and amphibologia, I would recommend you go read those in the art of English prosy. Um, just because I, I suggest reading those beforehand. We'll, we'll look at um, the ambiguous Amphibologia now, because um, that's the last figure uh, that is taught in the art of English poesy. So we're going to have a look at this now um, and then um, continue. So um, then you have one other vicious speech, which we will finish uh, this chapter and is when we speak or write doubtfully, and that the sense may be taken two ways, such ambiguous terms they call amphibologia. We call it the ambiguous, or the figure of sense in certain, as if one should say Thomas Taylor uh, saw William Tyler drunk. It is indifferent to think either the one or the other drunk. Thus said a gentleman in our vulgar prettily, notwithstanding because he did it not ignorantly, but for the nonce, I sat by my lady soundly sleeping, my mistress lay by me bitterly weeping. No man can tell by this whether the mistress or the man slept or wept. These doubtful speeches were used much in the old time by the f their false prophets, as appeareth by the oracles of Delphus and of Sibylle. Prophecies uh, devised by the religious persons of those days to abuse the superstitious people and to encumber their busy brains with vain hopes or vain fears. Uh, Lucretius the Merry Greek reciteth a great number of them devised by a cozening champion, one Alexander, to get himself the name and reputation of the god Asclepius. And in effect, all our British Sa and Saxon prophecies be of the same sort, that turn them on which side ye will, the matter of them be verified. Uh, nevertheless, carrieth generally such force in the heads of fond people that by the comfort of those blind prophecies many insurrections and rebellions have been stirred up in this realm, or real me, um, realm, uh, as that of Jack Straw and Jack Cade. Jack, both are diminutives of John, of course, uh, in Richard II's time and in our time by a seditious fellow in Norfolk calling himself Captain Kett and others in other places of the realm, real me realm, led altogether by certain prophetical rhymes uh, which might be construed two or three ways as well as to that one whereunto the rebels applied it. Our maker shall therefore avoid all such ambiguous speeches unless it be when he doth it for the nonce and for some purpose. Now, what you'll notice in this last figure that he's teaching are a few names. Um, just bear those in mind. We're talking, as in the previous videos I mentioned, about counterfeit representations. Um, and these names and mistaken identities, uh, as in the previous case of Thomas Taylor and William Tyler, um, these are all important things for what is going to follow. So these come from the Art of English Poesy, which we've been talking about in the previous uh, videos. Last time we looked specifically at this device of the Ancora Spy, Richard Field's printing device. And we unpicked that. We looked at what the Ancora uh, meant, uh, an Latin for or, which was really important. 
because translated into Greek, it's also e, that important e. And we also looked um, at the very clever little epitaph, um, epigram, I should say, uh, how it has um, or in it a number of times. So an is or, uh, core, you've got the or there. And also, I, I probably should have said this last time, um, but the P, which is the Greek row, you've also got an or there. So you've got or three times. Um, now, I'm very thankful to Stephen Hushkowitz, if I'm saying your name, uh, name right. Thank you so much for commenting on the previous video and let me know this because I didn't know this. But or in Hebrew equals light. And Hebrew is quite important because um, I believe our author uh, also knew a bit of Hebrew slash published a book on it. Anyway, so or also means light. Now, that's really important because I also I think I mentioned in the last video about Ra uh, being the god of sunshine and that those uh, clouds there being in front of a sun. Um, now, this is quite important, um, partly because Alexander Ward did a brilliant video uh, that I very much enjoyed. So I'd encourage you to go watch that because I thought that was great. Uh, entitled "Was Christopher Marlowe Shakespeare's Servant?" Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a um, I'm gonna have a punt at um, trying to answer that actually uh, for you, Alexander. But Alexander in that video, which is brilliant and I found very stimulating, um, also kind of alerted me to something that I kind of had spotted but I didn't really understand, which was these um, these rays of sunshine. And he goes into uh, talking about Apollo. Um, now, sunshine is really important because I found these hidden images in the Drusel portrait by shining a bright light through the back of it. Um, so sunshine is really, really important. And I'm going to speak a little bit more about Apollo um, in a second. But also just clock the first thing in this book is to the reader. Full stop. To the reader. That's the first thing here. Just remember that because that's going to be so important for pretty much everything that follows in a bit. So let's just talk about um, Apollo. As I said, do go watch uh, Alexander's video because um, I thought that was great. Um, let's just talk about Apollo. Apollo, the god of sunshine, of, of the sun. Um, also the god of artistic learning, um, music and poetry. He's the god of poetry. Um, also which is quite important. Uh, he's the god of uh, the patron god of uh, shepherds um, and herdsmen, which is quite important, um, which is very important, actually. Um, now, he is uh, he always hangs around with the muses. Some might say he's the 10th muse, uh, which is important because in Sonnet 38, um, we're talking about when thou thyself doth give invention light, be thou the tenth muse, ten times more in worth. Well, you might notice that or in more and or in worth there. Um, so De Vere very much is um, the is Apollo the tenth muse. Um, ten is an important number. One being self, zero being nothing as well. That's really important. Um, so Apollo. Very, very important. Thank you to Alexander for kind of really um, highlighting that uh, for me, because that's going to be really important uh, for what I'm about to go into and show you. So the first thing I, I wanted to do was kind of have a look because I, I, I missed this um, or didn't realise the significance of it. Um, is the references to Apollo in the art of English posing. Uh, so you'll notice we have the same line three times. I know Alexander likes threes. Um, so there it is three times. Dan Phoebus rays into his horned head. Um, now, this line is actually really important um, because if you look, you've got the an and the or, uh, the IHS of his, uh, the ed or ned, if you think back to the um, the joke in, the, in Aristophanes' wasps, uh, ed on the end there. Um, the same thing here, repeated. I mean, I really like this. Um, so Dan Phoebus... Uh, raised into his horned head, and I myself, by learned law, perceived that the spring, or perhaps veer, approached, and frosty winter fled. I crossed the Thames to take the cheerful air in open fields. The weather was so fair. Well, what's across? Um, well, yeah, notice the oar. Um, 
what's across the Thames? Well, we have um, uh, well, we have Blackfriars on this side, and across the Thames, uh, we have the Globe Theatre. Perhaps that's cheerful air. But for me, the most important thing about this is the in open fields. Okay. Why? Because the printer's preface, that really, really important printer's preface, right back from the first video, was by Richard Field. Uh, dwelling in the Blackfriars, just clock that address. That's what I'm going to say. And we looked at the very important printing preface, which is uh, by the author of this book. Very, very clever, very witty. Myself a book, uh, myself a book, my, my, myself, my present a book and myself with that magic conceit e a printer oh just clock the inversion there of the capitals and the hyphen something's going on with that address and also we looked at nothing i'm just going to remind you of the nothing because that's also going to be important for something a bit later uh, we, uh, with his bare title without any author's name i doubted how well it might become me to purport so slender a subject as nothing almost could be a simple faculty, faculty, cipher, the archaic meaning of naught or nothing, the thing, something we choose not to give a name to, I humbly take my leave. Um, these are important, and I said, and uh, the first view of this, my impression, which you might also hear. Um, so, why was this device really important? Well, um, it was on the front of the Art of English Posey, it's also on the front of Venus and Adonis, uh, 1593 and Lucrece 1594 I think uh, so this same device is being used on Shakespeare's work now I wanted to know my questions that my research questions that I had um, were when did Richard Field first use the Anchor Spy and who first made it we knew from the we know from the last video that it's really really important it's um, it's the emblem um, of De Vere for what, what it means referring to that Hebrews uh, 6.19. So it's, it's clearly very important. So when was it first used by Richard Field, uh, who in the preface is pretending not to be who he is, uh, and who first made it? So I thought I should probably reach out to some people who know uh, much more to me. Brilliant name for this. This is uh, Adam Hooks, um, who is lovely and wonderful. And thank you so much, Um for what you very kindly sent me. Uh, I don't know why I, I didn't ask for it, but you very kindly sent me this um, wonderful uh, piece uh, by Kirkwood, um, which was very, very stimulating and, and um, just brilliant. So thank you so much, Adam Hooks. He's got a brilliant website, actually, uh, as I was doing some research um, after on the Anchor of Spice, got some really great stuff on there. So I'd encourage you to go and check that out. Uh, and within this brilliant paper by Kirkwood, there was also reference to this very good book by Makuro, um on printers and publishing devices. So I thought, OK, um, I'm finding lots of really interesting things in Kirkwood. Uh, let's read this book. So I did. So I tracked down all of the Ancora spies um, that I could find in Makuro's uh, book. Um, there seems to be six of them in there, all um, by Richard Field or the or Thomas Vautrolier, who um, Richard Field was an apprentice to. Uh, so I had a look at the publications that were associated, uh, what was printed with uh, these devices. Um, and so the first question was, when did Richard Field use the Ancora spy? Well, it seems to be uh, with a book dealing with the French political situation. That seems to be the first time he uh, he used it. Entered in the stationer's register. Now, I, sh I should um, I should point out we should always be critical and sceptical with every bit of information that we're coming across. That includes what I'm saying. Please be really critical uh, with whatever. Uh, we're being presented with, even if it is in the station as register. OK, so just be really critical. Um, and the Art of English Posy, which was the second piece. So it seems that this book here, The Restorer of the French Estate, was the first thing that Richard Field uh, used this device of the Anchor Spy on. Note the address. Uh, so let's just have a look at To the Reader. Uh, 
there came forth a discourse on the present state of France in the year last past, which surely did some good. Now cometh forth another written as appeareth by the same or author for restoring the state of France, uh, which is likely to do more good. The work, oh, look at that E, being first conceived by a high wit and after shaped by ripe experience, seemeth sithence to have passed through some rude and unclean, notice the E on that, hand, and yet is not so misshapen or defaced thereby, but that the lineaments remaining do soon E uh, describe the, the first workman, and thus much for the form for me perhaps um for that for the matter it is no counterfeit stuff how interesting so the form of the for me um perhaps is counterfeit but the matter is no counterfeit stuff but will abide the touch of the safest maxims in policy and the trial of the soundest principles in religion uh, and as the discreet reader I know, will suspend his judgment, please do, uh, till he perceiveth, uh, perceive the author's purpose. So let the saucy censurer, um, I love that, uh, know the height thereof, uh, summeth the reach of his carping conceit. Farewell. Well, I definitely think there's some conceit going on. Again, uh, this to the reader uh, has some very interesting things in it. Uh, so, what else did um, Field do? Well, Field um, printed Lucrece and Venus and Adonis, um, but printed them, um, the imprints are to be sold at the sign of a, of a different address. So there's a different address, and that these are the Shakespeare's first work. Um, so notice in Open Court by Field, if we think before to what I showed you. Uh, Field's other publishing, well, what else is Field publishing? Well, he's publishing some major political works, such as... Spencer's Fairy Queen, some Sir William Alexander poetry, Philip Sidney's work. So he's quite a um, quite a uh, established printer, printing some great things. Um, this was uh, this was Richard Field's sign, um, and Kirkwood says I am in doubt, in some doubt as to what the bird is. It may be a phoenix rising from its nest of flames, or it may be the splayed eagle. Uh, which it was known, which was later the sign of Field's shop in Great Wood Street. Uh, I very much think uh, that is a phoenix, as we shall later see. Uh, so, who first made the Angkor Spy and when was it first used? Well, it seems that the first person that made this particular Angkor Spy uh, was Thomas Votrolier, um, who Richard Field was apprenticed to. And if we have a look at what Thomas Votrolier was doing, well, he was translating a lot of really great works, Calvin, Luther, Cicero, and also had some really great things himself. Uh, Richard Mulcaster, a prominent educator, um, and North's translation of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. Very influential for Shakespeare. Uh, and if I, I had a look at some of the first things uh, that he would he was doing, and we have like the New Testaments uh, that he's translating, um, by Beza, um, and I also found this by Theodore uh, Beza, by uh, Thomas Voltrolier, um, which I thought was really interesting because it's been translated into English by Arthur uh, Golding, which is, um, if we if we think about who that was, he first translated Ovid's Metamorphoses, uh, Metamorphoses, I should say, uh, from Latin to English, and was also the uncle of De Vere and his third tutor, and De Vere likely helped him in this uh, act of translating uh, Ovid into English. How interesting. Uh, and also, just uh, just note, note the, uh, the address there. Interesting. So, um, if we actually have a look, it seems that Thomas and Richard just couldn't decide on how to spell Blackfriars. You would assume... Um, that as as printers doing this for quite a while, they might have decided on a spelling for Blackfriars. Lots of E's uh, in there, lots of inverted capitals and hyphens. How interesting. It seems they couldn't decide on an address. 
Now, in the Kirkwood, I also found something really interesting um, that, uh, of course, attracted my attention immediately. Field's most ambitious venture in the publication of poetry was his handsome edition in 1951 of John Harrington's translation of Orlando uh, Furioso, replete with engravings and produced with the utmost care. As for the, uh, for the pictures he writes in the advertisement to the reader... They are all cut in brass, E on the end. There was no way uh, that I wasn't going to read that. Uh, so uh, what did I do? I I uh, went to track down some Orlando Furioso by John Harrington. And I started to notice, or, or an, or, ah, uh, um, and the Latin translation there. To have won the approval of important people is not the last degree of praise. So it's not um, wanting the approval um, all the praise for these works. So I, I decided to to start read uh, reading um, what was in the front of it. Oh, um, little garden of my slender skill. Oh, slender skill. And is the less worthy? Is barren, overshaded. Um, oh, how interesting. The beams of your heavenly countenance. How interesting. Sign on so poor a uh, soil. Uh, shallow. So we're getting lots of these ideas of nothing, barren, slender, uh, because I love to be plain, my poor family. And then we have our double V, our devere that we've seen, though uh, unperfect and unworthy work, E on the end. Uh, so already I'm I'm pretty convinced um, that this is just from having a look at that, um, probably not by John Harrington. Uh, so if we have a look uh, at from the uh, an advertisement to the reader before. Um, if we have a look, well, sundry. I love this word, sundry. Um, I, I really adore it. Um, nor to dispute how high and supernatural the name of the maker is so christened in English by that unknown godfather that this last year, save one, uh, viz. 1589, set forth a book called The Arts of English Posy. And least of all do I propose to bestow any long time to argue, blah, 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 blah. Master Golding translated Ovid's Metamorphoses and myself in this work that you see. Mm. I will refer you to, Philip, uh, to Sir Philip Sidney's apology, as would put me in great hope. In this age to come would breed many excellent poets, for though the poor gentleman... Bloody bloody blah, blah, blah. Sure, in my poor opinion, he doth prove nothing more plainly uh, than that which Mr. Sidney and all the learned sort that have written of it do pronounce. Because making himself and many others so cunning in the art, yet he showeth himself so slender a gift in it. Uh, if you translate that Latin, you ought to be praised when you write poems without the blessing of Apollo or the muses, for that was Cicero's vice. Um, so without praise, being pl being praised or recognised without praise. Uh, think I truly, if we remember De Vere's uh, family motto, nothing truer than truth. Watch out for those truths, those verities. Also, I noticed, and, and I know many scholars um, have done some work on this. I know Alexander mentioned it in his last video. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about it later. Also, in this book e, uh, of Orlando Furioso, you have um, this nice um, uh, device here of these two A's, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Of importance, though. Um, now, why is John Harrington so important? Well, we know the art of English poesy, as Richard Field tells us. Uh, this book coming to my hands without his bare title, without any author's name or any other ordinary address. Well, who was the first person to allude to the art of English poesy being by Putnam, do you think? Oh, in 1590, John Harrington refers to the book's author as Putnam. So John Harrington, the person who I already think is De Vere, uh, is the first person to refer to the authors uh, to, the, to the the author of this book as Putnam. So it would seem uh, that De Vere is fabricating uh, his own red herrings. That's really really important, and actually uh, you'll see this with a few other authors. Uh, but let's not get too 
high, uh, too far ahead of ourselves. Um, I could, I should also say in the, the figure of the recounter, uh, when I was a scholar in Oxford, well, you should note that George Putnam went to Cambridge. He didn't go to Oxford for a start. And every, uh, 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 they called every such one Joannes, uh, your John there, Johannes, John is again um, from that, uh, ad oppositum, uh, so someone who's quarrelling, uh, this is the quarreller, so uh, John Harrington is certainly quarrelling. Uh, George Putnam, well, letters we've talked about in the past, the E, the Eater, uh, the T, the Tab being Mark, if you just put those in Putnam, you get George Putnam. I've, I've been saying this, I said this in my book, that I believe George Putnam is a complete red herring as Richard Field tells you in the preface, coming to my hands without the author's name on it. Uh, so, um, John Harrington translating classics from Italian into English. Hmm. Well, I thought let's have a look at some of other uh, works by John Harrington. And there's this wonderful, oh, was that double the beer there? Um, let's have a look at this one, a new discourse on a stale subject called the metamorphosis of Ajax, come on, it's spelling, it, it really is kind of spelling it out for you. And we have our Ancora Spy on the front, uh, printed by Richard Field. Now, this book is really, really funny, actually. Um, and in it actually lays out uh, the idea for the first ever flushing toilet. Uh, so I believe already we are dealing with an absolute genius um, and a Renaissance uh, man who is, well, come on, he, he's... He's laying out ideas for the first ever flushing toilet, uh, which arguably is why the toilet is called the Jacks, may even, although contended, be why we call it the John. Um, and, oh, that I were at Ox Oxenford to eat some Banbury cakes. Don't know why I included that, but I thought it was funny. Anyway, uh, so um, in part one, we looked at this um, and we kind of dissected this. I showed you it was really important, the peak behind the curtain, uh, which goes back to our Hebrews 619 reference. Uh, by Mr. Henry Peacham, the Minerva Britannia. Now, um, interestingly, uh, one of the pages in this, we have this, to the Honourable Lord Harrington, which would have been John Harrington. Um, and it's all about, well, the Caspian Sea, as histories do show, where rocky shores on every side surround was never seen, need to double V there, by man to ebb or flow. It was never seen by man, Eon that scene as well by man to ebb or flow but still abides the same within his bounds so it's never seen to ebb and flow how interesting um oh is that philip sydney there as well that's that's interesting so i i had a look at um to the reader of mr henry peachams because to the reader seems to be very important it's the first thing in the first folio uh, a subject very rare I know not an Englishman in our age that hath published any work of this kind, they being, I doubt not, as ingenious and happy in their invention as the best French or Italian of them all. Uh, learning and arts, arts, hath, uh, blah, 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 um, hath she uh, uh, excelled in this as in all other rare inventions. Um, sundry, oh, that's that lovely word again. Um, Edward the Black Prince. I love this. It, you're going to hear constant referrals to princes, actually, as well. Edward the Black Prince. Black's really important because black is nothing, right? That's the absence of light. It's the complete inversion of uh, light. It, it, it's, it's the absence. So Edward the Black Prince. You have that nothing there as well. Uh, sunburnt brains, emblems to sundry and great personages, transcendence, this idea of transcendence, which is really important, even with a phoenix, uh, as I have ever been myself. Uh, and oh, if we have a look at the next page, there's a son there, um, Henricus uh, Peachamus. Well, note the double V that he's put in his name. Come on, this so obvious. Um, well, if we have a look at this page here, look, there's a phoenix there. Um, and I think the really important thing, other than the, the this frontis device here, is this bit here. I think this is really important. I think arguably this is one of the most important things uh, on this uh, frontis piece, uh, which is printed in um, a title page, printed in Shoe Lane at the sign of the Falcon by VVA Dite. 
or we could argue that's the double V again. Well, it just so happens there happens to be one um, illustration of a falcon in Minerva Britannia. Um, and I think this is very important because the falcon is leaving this mysterious hand coming out of the clouds. Um, I, I think this is great. Uh, so better likes the field and forest spray and for himself in elder age to pray. Truly noble. I love the art in the caterpillar. There's oars all over the place and right at the bottom there, which is lovely. The V is or is V. Uh, which I really like. But if we have a look a little bit more at this, but better likes the field. Well, we've seen fields already and it's got an E on the end. We've got our or and our ra. Um, we've got our or himself with an E on the end and a ra there as well. It's lovely. I also love this one. Oh, is that a phoenix? We've spoken about the eater and the E. Uh, eater, uh, the E in Jesus of the uh, the. Uh, monogram um if we have a look here when double v uh when valiant richmond gave the overthrow a usurping richard on that fatal field um of bosworth as our histories to show this emblem he devised for his shield um for when the battle holy was his own mm, well can we think of any um oh interest uh so the anchor is by uh richard's emblem there um, and also, I love this. You have a veer. <laughs> it's great. You have a veer directly um, adjacent to that. Come on. It's, it's, it's just brilliant. There's loads of great things there. Um, the author to his muse, which comes like set, like midway through this book, uh, Double V or Love and Light, the LL, which I've explained, uh, I think, previously in a long book. It's quite important. Uh, as Phoebus, uh, Light, um, Phoebus Apollo, LL, Art, um, uh, as the dictator, um, all in time. The May, May is also very important uh, if you've read the printer's preface within the city, bear a greater sway. Um, I love this actually. Um, as the dictator, all in the time, the May within the city, bear a greater sway. Well, if you have a look at what he's wrote here, um, I think that's Cincinnati or something, I'm not entirely sure, but a noble Roman uh, called from his plough to the dictatorship. Well, if you notice the A and T within uh, dictator, A is the has its history with the ox, T was the mark in the field uh, where they were ploughing, uh, the ox was ploughing to, to go to that mark, so you had nice straight rows in the field. And this is talking about a noble uh, Roman... Uh, could call dictator from his plough in the field. So I just think it's really brilliant. Um, so uh, this one as well, to you great prince who little need be known. So this is someone who deliberately doesn't want to be known by me or by my worthless uh, posy. Uh, the most noble prince, uh, beside his admiration, admirable knowledge in all learning, all learning, the languages hath excellent skill in music uh, so does apollo uh, muses you see there uh, monuments uh, art there's loads oh phoenix sun oh phoenix sun it's all them there's loads of references directly as well to the phoenix phoebus apollo phoenix phoenix it's it's literally shouting at you but while you are uh, consuming in the fame, uh, in the same, you breed a second, your immortal fame. If we have a look at the conclusion, uh, or Aurora, which is light and Phoebus, uh, I really like this um, about the printer's devices and all her gallant knights uh, and such as actors in her conquests were great Edward III. Uh, you might see there with that victorious prince, his son, son, uh, Phoenix. And uh, now that they were on every tree, devices new as well as old, as those brave worthies faithfully shall in another book be told. Goodness, how many books are there? Uh, quite a few. Um, what did uh, Votrolier first print? Well, OK, I'm starting to doubt uh, some of the people who are printing uh, these books um you have to look into those books and 
and, and do a bit of inspection, but you'll find a lot of these common devices from what seems to be the same author. So when did Vautrelier first, uh, what did Vautrelier first print? Um, well, this is what he first printed, actually. This is the first writing book of handwriting to be printed in England. It's quite an important book with an E on the end. Uh, De Vere's, it's even telling you on the front, um, that curly uh, epsilon there, which you're going to see time and time again, actually, and now I'm thinking about it. Uh, Blackfriars, all notice the address there. Italian, true, uh, fourth with the or in, uh, printed, um, all kind of in alignment there. We have some rows and some ands, some ors, I should say. Um, I love I love the, the p's and the the r's because you've got row one way and an or, the both ors back and forth. I love them. Um, the great uh, same ors ors. Uh, we even have an or in Vautrelier. Um, <laughs> he loves fabricating stories. He really does. Um, and if we, I also quite this secret court hands actually. Um, there's loads going on there. Um, he's also printed some this wonderful book of history. So he's also writing these the history of the church. If we just have a look at to the right honourable, um, well, Vere Edward Earl, or Art, like it's all here. Um, some let's talk about some of the important books that Thomas, um, uh, pen uh, printed. And or both actually slip of the tongue, but um, so this brilliant book here, Positions by um, Richard Mulcaster, he was a prominent educator. Um, well, this is a very, very important book on education of children. So we're talking about education. And one of the poems in the front is Author Ipsa Ad Librum Sum. Well, that translates as he is responsible for his own book. He is responsible for his Publishing, you could say. Um, if anyone's really great at translating Latin, please do translate the many Latin um, uh, dedications and poems that are in all of these things, because I believe they're going to be really important. And my Latin, I'm sorry, uh, is very much in its elemental developmental uh, stages. So please do translate uh, for me, although that probably would actually now think about be a good exercise for me. Um, anyway, so uh, it that same thing. Uh, the same uh, author ipsa ad librum sum is also in this book here, the first part of the elemental, again, bearing the Ancora spy, which is his signature of this is my work. Uh, notice the Blackfriars again. Uh, now, this is a very important book um, because it's setting down English grammar and teaching about education. It's an incredibly important book. Um, it's one. He's the founder of le, uh, lexico, lexicography, in in a sense, um, which is it's such an important book. In it, he 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 add he outlines eight thousand words, which are currently in usage, um, and it's such an important book. Uh, I I love some of this for the forwarding. I mean, to be somewhat curious, uh, as there shall want nothing for the help for the full help of either true spelling true or reading sure very or he teaches actually about the e and the qualifying e that e we're seeing on the end of words well he actually teaches about it as well which is crazy i love this uh, for v v and o be so great cousins even in cousinage as the one uh, enter middleth with the other should very much well if you think about what cozening means uh, it means to cheat or to deceive uh, i'm not even going to mention this but loads of e's neds <laughs> um, what i think is probably the most important thing um, in this book and i think probably one of the second peeks behind the curtain into why the author is doing what he's doing is the peroration, the conclusion, to my gentle readers and good countrymen wherein many things are handled concerning learning in general and the nature of the English and foreign tongues besides some particular uh, particularities concerning the penning of this and other books in English. Um, and for me, this is kind of his treatise, where he's, treatise, where he's, la where he's laying out uh, what it is he is trying to do now, again, Richard Mulcaster, who probably is a real person, um, I don't doubt that, um, 
But if, if you read this, myself uh, intending at the first to deal but with tongues and the teaching thereof in the grammar school, as he thought of his justice in civil doings, was likewise enforced by sway of meditation, so perhaps he's not doing that, to enter in thought of the whole course of learning. So he's thinking about the whole course of learning and to be and to consider how every particular thing did arise in degree one after another. For without that consideration, how could I have discerned where to begin, how to proceed and where to end in any one thing which dependeth upon a sequel and marcheth from a principle, seeing the matter which I deal with is a matter of assent, wherein every particular that goeth before hath uh, contain, contain, uh, contain uh, wall respect to that which cometh after. If the whole uh, plat plan uh, be artificially cast, as in this course of mine, the elementary principles may resemble the first groundwork, the teaching of tongues, the second stories, the after learning, the upper buildings, which are uh, now as in architecture and artificial buildings. He were no good workman uh, which would not cast his frame so as each of the ascents might be comfortable to other. So in the degrees of learning, it were no masterly part not to observe the like which cannot be observed before the whole be thought on. So he's thinking about the whole of learning before he's going to teach it and thoroughly fashioned in the part's mind which pre uh, pretendeth the work. <laughs> I actually quite like that. Um, so um, he's thinking about how he's going to structure this learning. He wants to teach learning. He is a lover of learning and he wants to teach his Englishman um, this wonderful learning from antiquity. And he's thinking about how he's going to teach it before he even begins. And he's going to start with the teaching of tongues and grammar. Well, you just saw the first book was on handwriting. Um, he's teaching or, or writing. He's teaching grammar here. Then he's going to teach stories and then the, the upper echelons. He, this is a master builder. Uh, the upper echelons of maybe morality uh, and really higher order things, whatever they might be. Uh, I love this book uh, with a passion. I'm a servant to my country. And these are some of my favourite quotes. Uh, for, his sake, for her sake, I will travel. Uh, travel her circumstances, I must consider. And whatsoever I shall pen... I will see it executed by the grace of God, mine own self, to persuade other uh, the better by a tried proof. For that all which I do concerneth my country, youth and tongue. It entertaineth her profit and envieth not her pleasure and desireth to see her enriched. So in every kind of argument and honoured so with every ornament of eloquence as she may vie with the foreign if I may work it with wishing. He wants English to rival the languages of uh, of Greek and Latin and of Italian. He wants our English tongue uh, to vie with them, to be as great. And I really, surely, truly believe that he succeeds um, in, in what he's trying to do. Uh, in this last kind, mine own labour travaileth to seek uh, for uniformity, to strip away uh, the needless. I love this. Ned D. Luss. It's brilliant uh, to supply some defects uh, to do mine endeavour to help everyone in as quiet a course as I can temper my style unto. He's going to try to do this um, invisibly. He, he's trying to hide away to not take uh, credit for this or praise his own name. Um, as I think it was, was Cicero wrongly fell into. He, he doesn't want uh, the praise for this. He's he's trying to he's doing this for his country. I love this is one of my favorite. I love Rome, but London better. I favor Italy, but England more. I honor the Latin, but I worship the English. He loves his country and he loves the English tongue and he is dedicated to make it a great tongue, to enrich it, uh, to give our English tongue grace. Uh, God bless us all to the advancement of his glory, the honour of our country, the furtherance of good learning, uh, the good of all degrees, both prince and people. This is a man who is who wishes to enrich our English tongue. And whew, does he? So, OK, here we go. Buckle your seatbelts. 
I thought, OK, well, let's have a look at some people who've translated uh, from the Italian into uh, English. Um, and one said person that many people have uh, authorship uh, queries about is John Florio. Well, let's have a look at some of these devices. John Florio who was a brilliant translator um, and has done quite a lot. Well, here we go. Translated out of sundry, sundry, the best Italian authors with certain necessary rules for Englishmen to attain to the perfection of the Italian tongue and for Italians to learn the pronunciation of our English. In the end, uh, they would needs, though sore against my will, always watch out for those wills, have it put forth in print. But I write honourable. Well, where have we see that right honourable before? Um, it, it's it's all here. Uh, most courteous reader, at the request of sundry, my friends, I present my first fruits. It it's all there. Come to light. I F. Remember how uh, Richard Field signs his name. If we have a look at the poems dedicated in the front of it, cast anchor here. Uh, those which saw not his transformed face. Um, if we have our, if you look, sundry, if it were strange, one self should neck, should bear two sundry heads and face more than one. It was as uh, strange, one self, uh, same head should wear two sundry horns like an ox where nature grafted none and is more strange to see one self, same face, two sundry tongues and speeches to embrace. Um, the tree was framed according to the fruit, an English stock, but an Italian plants. I've remembered some water this time, thankfully. One man, one tree, two sundry, two sundry men, blah, 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 blah. Um, look, English may quickly flourish in our English fields. May fields flourish. Florio, come on. Um, like it's, it's all here, true to his prints, but art and ease, but look and learn. Uh, second fruits, very important as well. Um, a world of words, um, again, like incredibly important. If you have a look at it, you've got this printed by Hatfield, Edward Blunt, North Door. Um, I know not to the reader, always read to the reader. I know not how I may again adventure an epistle to the reader, blah, 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 conceited in their peevishness. So should I fear the fire and have felt the shipwreck? Remember, shipwrecks are important. Uh, then what will the world say for venturing again? Poor, poor, I love this word, remember, because uh, of the uh, all this way, the all this way, and again, meaning light as well. Uh, one put herself in service to excellent earls, uh, worth um, both in the world to run the race of their fortune. Uh, if we have a look at the poems in the uh, front again, oh, look at these anchors. We've met this device in previous videos. They're all there for you if you choose to be aware and notice them. Um, now, the essays of Mr. Montaigne were very influential uh, to him. I think um, Nietzsche said that uh, Shakespeare uh, was uh, the best reader of Montaigne. Have a reason for that. Um, uh, so... And like many scholars have uh, have said how important uh, the essays of Montaigne are uh, and Florio has translated them into English. Uh, if you have a look in the front, it's dedicated to the lady Anne Harrington, wife of John Harrington, who we've already met before. If you read to the reader, um, <laughs> enough, if not too much, hath been said of this translation. If the faults found even by myself in the first impression, have we met first impressions before? But now by the printer corrected, I'm I'm sure, as he that hath directed the work is much amended. If not, know that through mine attendance of his majesty, I could not intend and blame, not Neptune, shipwreck. Uh, he's even saying, what do you think, reader? Well, what do you think, reader? Um, Towers, Prince Montaigne, uh, if he uh, if he be not more, okay, seizure. Um, uh, wrap excellency up never so much in hieroglyphics, ciphers, and characters. Well, I do believe he's uh, wrapping excellency up uh, in ciphers, meaning nothing, and characters. 
Um, I think, yeah, it is brilliant. brilliant. Um, I also like this concerning the honour of books and all their greatness quite forgotten lies and when and how they flourished. No man heeds how poor remembrance are statues, uh, statutes, uh, tombs and other monuments that men erect to princes which remain in closed rooms where but a few behold them in respect of books. Uh, that to the universal eye show how they lived and other where they lie. We're, we're talking about books with any uh, that are lying. Um, well, this book in particular is very, very um, important, partly because it's one of the first dictionaries. Uh, it has over 75,000 uh, words um, that are defined in it. It's so, uh, so important. Um, and if we have a look, oh, an, an, or, 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 an, an, or, and continue, uh, <laughs> ands and ors, or, an, quite a lot of those devices that we've already been seeing right on the front of it. Uh, if we have a look here, look at this portrait of John Florio. Come on, man. The sun's right there. Um, an, or an come on you 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 get the idea okay it's it's literally all here for you um if you look for it uh all the e's all the e's or or an or and then notice we also have some arts uh with the e on the end there as well so i very much believe that de Vere, uh was uh writing under this name of florio uh he Florio probably was a real person, but he's publishing his work under his name, Thomas North. <laughs> yep. Let's have a look at another uh, work that's been published by uh, Votrolier or Field. Uh, the Lives of uh, um, of Noble uh, Grecians and Romans by um, translating the Plutarch, which again was so um, important um, for Shakespeare, for Julius Caesar, Antony Cleopatra, Coriolanus, Timon Tim of Athens. It's it's all there. Um, look, devices in front. Apart from, we can't seem to work out whether we're uh, Thomas Vitrolier or Richard Field there. I'm, I'm not entirely sure of that. That's because um, I think, really, they're the same person. They might also be real people, but the author, um, the printer, is uh, the same. So, uh, well, we've got... As we've said, the same devices. Well, if we have a look um, at uh, the Thomas uh, North's work. So we have God and continue and hope. Uh, all like all there. I, I promise you uh, this again is likely uh, by De Vere. I think it is. Uh, if we have a look um, at uh, another a thing that's been published by uh, Thomas Votrolier, uh, this time in Edinburgh. I, I might say that could be interpreted as an ox, who knows. Um, but what's important is what's inside of this. Again, uh, we have uh, a phoenix. And very importantly, now I actually accidentally stumbled upon this um, when I was finding or researching something quite differently, and I found it in um, Pete Dawkins' um, publication, which I thought was brilliant. Uh, I'm, a, I'm aware, apparently, according to Alexander's last video, there's other scholars doing this. I'm really sorry, I haven't read your work. If you um, uh, like, give me a message or something, I'll happily put your names in the uh, the comments to this. Um, but I, it's this gentleman's uh, wonderful publication that I'm drawing, and these are his uh, things. So just notice these headpieces, right? So in the one that we've just had a look at with the Phoenix in uh, the essays of a, a, a apprentice a pr apprentice in the divine art of poesy, similar to the art of English poesy, we have this headpiece. We also have this headpiece there. These A's are important. I think it was Gabriel Harvey that said uh, A per se A. Again, A uh, has its history in the ox. Uh, so these A's are really, really important. Um so we've got it in here and in the art of English poesy. So if it's in the art of English poesy, we can assume um, that these are strongly related. And also in Venus and Adonis, so in Shakespeare's work. Um, OK, Hamlet. Interestingly, uh, the Shepherd's Calendar, which we'll talk about in a bit. Shakespeare's Folio, we have these A's. 
also in Orlando Furioso, as we've spoken about, we've got these A's as well. So we can assume that is by De Vere. Uh, Philip Sidney, whose name we've seen a few times already. Well, if we have a look at the Shepherd's Calendar, whose headpiece you've just seen also in the Art of English Posy, some of those printing devices that are being used again, uh, to the noble and uh, veritas, come on now, uh, near unto Ludgate, uh, Ludgate, the source of a known um, postern for making discreet entrances and exits, um, very secretive. Um, if you have a look at January, well, we've got the Ancora Speam, which is that that Speam comes from Spy Hope. We have the Ancora Spy, uh, which is Colin's uh, emblem. So Colin's um, emblem is the Ancora Spy. How interesting. Um, so the Countess Pembroke's Arcadia, which is really important for the sub, the Gloucester subplot in um, King Lear. <laughs> also really interesting. Um, I've, I read this while his literary career is well known. He himself did not think of himself of, as a writer and only dedicated a small part of his life to writing. I wonder why he didn't think of himself as a writer. Uh, and if... <laughs> uh, because De Vere's publishing under his name. Uh, and if we have a look at this, um, one of the first critical essays in the English uh, tongue, in the English language, uh, by Philip Sidney. Well, it's staring at you in the face. I love it. Apollo. Brilliant. No apology for poetry, um, which he's responding to someone who, again, may not be who he's saying. If you have a look um, at the... Uh, at what it's saying inside, uh, back the glorious sunshine of divine posy, divine Sir Philip Sidney. Um, well, if they uh, will do well, will, lots of wills there. Um, it, it's just full of it. excellent posy. So created by this Apollo G. So I very much think, uh, again, De Beers writing under uh, Apollo's name. Uh, we have some very interesting poems in the front I'd encourage you to read, talking about knights, for instance. Um, well, we also uh, have come across already uh, Shepherd's Calendar and Edmund Spencer. Well, if we have a look at Amoretti, um, I do more confidently presume to publish in his absence under your name to whom, in my poor opinion, uh, though to yourself unknown, uh, worth my goodwill herein who seek no more but to show myself yours in all dutiful affection indeed uh, again you can see that sun behind the book and a number of other devices the verity TVA, like there's loads of stuff always going on and have a look at these wonderful to the author poems in the front always check out the poems in the front because they're also likely by the same author phoebus uh the time like night deprived cheerful day blah 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 sunshine um too many sides that art are perfect guides uh, so we that live and ages that succeed with great applause thy learned works shall uh, read well i hope um some of these very learned works will receive uh, the praise they rightfully deserve from this like he is the english aristotle and plato he, i i imagine he is one of the most published authors uh, in history. Uh, shepherds, remember I did say Apollo is the patron of shepherds as well, um, to climb the height of virtue's sacred hill can raise those records of lasting praise. Um, so we have our references to Phoebus uh, and shepherds there. Um, again, second part um, of the, well, the fairy queen, really uh, influential to Shakespeare, bearing this same emblem, double V, um, and we have many other people, Aurora Light, look at the headpiece there, um, uh, William Alexander's same thing, Edward Blunt, you can hear the same names coming up again and again, but he did tell you this, uh, uh, in the, the figure of um, the ambiguous, again, we've got the same, wherever you see this Angkor spy, um, just presume that Edward de Vere is behind it uh, in some way. Also love this, uh, Edmund Bolton, who also said something about George Putnam. Uh, we have um, the sun there again. 
Uh, we also have this, which I love, which you could see there's a V within that X of V. Um, and if you have a look, there's loads of things in it. I really like this for that, uh, for thou art read that art. And I really would strongly recommend reading the art of English posy. Uh, that's the key uh, very much to kind of understanding a lot of what's going on and where the author reveals his identity. Um, yep. John D. They had close associations. The letters of sundry great men. Um, well, if we have a look at some sundry uh, great men um, uh, who inspired this. Well, if we have a look in this book, you have the sun and the moon in Roger Bacon, uh, Apollo, Anne, or so there's loads of things going on. You have uh, some triangles with some uh, crosses here, um, the law by inspiration. Um, there's loads of things going on. If we actually have a look at some of the things that um, John D has done. One is on the perfect art of navigation. It's quite important, I think, because um lays down the foundation of um, uh, having a great naval fleet, which was quite important for the British Empire. Um, but if we have a look at the many devices that are going on, well, first off, we have our sun, our Apollo. Watch out for that device because it's everywhere. We have our double A's, our RAS. Uh, and our oars, our ands, there's loads of them are up. We have 10 stars there. Uh, our kairos, uh, row, row, our oars, in other words, the um, Amiga was a long O sound as well. Uh, so you've got loads of devices going on there. Um, now, he also did some brilliant things. He was the first per one of the first people to translate uh, Euclid. So capturing all of that learning from antiquity and translating it into English to better enrich uh, the learning of our great country and our tongue. So he's the first person to like translate translate Euclid. Um, oh, sons. Uh, Volnir, can you notice that double V? Uh, that's a U there. That doesn't have that second one doesn't have to be a U, but you have a double V uh, right there. That's truth flourishes from wounds. Um, there's loads of things going on there, but uh, the translator to the reader, um, there is gentle reader, nothing. The word of God only set apart, blah, blah, blah. blah. Uh, the fruit and game which I require for these, my pains and travail. Uh, shall be nothing else again. Um, what's this say? Uh, by means whereof our English tongue shall no less be enriched uh, with good authors than our other strange tongues. Um, so he's enriching our English language and to, moreover to excite and stir up others learned. Um, so he's really trying to capture the, the learning from the Greeks and the Latins and bring it over to our country. He is the Renaissance man trying uh, to transport Renaissance learning uh, to England. And in these are days we see their do. I love this because, well, it's imprinted in London by John Day. It's being printed by John Day. And in these days we see their do. It shall encourage me hereafter in such like sort uh, to translate and set abroad some other good authors, to translate some other good authors, both pertaining to religion, as partly I have already done, indeed he has, uh, and also pertaining to mathematical art. So he's not just translating uh, history uh, and great stories and poetry, but he's translating maths. And of course, uh, Francis Bacon... Uh, again, so hopefully this is vindication to the many people who thought uh, Florio was uh, Shakespeare. I agree with you. And Francis Bacon. I also agree with you. If we have a look at just three of these books and I'm going to try and do this quickly. But hopefully you guys can start to see this already. Ra, 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 sons. Uh, if we have a look at the an, uh, the oars and the ands, uh, same thing. We have uh, quite a few of them on these title pages. Title pages always so important. Well, if we have a look, books with the E on the end, and it even says Oxford on the front of it, uh, which is lovely. If you have a look at this picture, you've got V's going all the way around um, uh, the portrait there. If you have a look, we've got double V, that de V, three times, three times on that. Um, also notice, I really like this, Verulam, Verulam, he's Baron or Lord Verulam. 
this was a title that was created specifically for uh, Sir Francis Bacon. A title specifically for him. Verulam. Well, that's got Veer in. I wonder why. They are literally telling you. Um, so, <laughs> Christopher Marlowe. <laughs> mysterious early death. Greatly influenced Shakespeare. One of the greatest writers of his time. Well, let's have a look at what's going on with the title pages. Double V, double V. Or, or, uh, JB, Ben Johnson, JB, uh, Nicholas, um, uh, Vavasur, um, that's important um, for uh, the nicknamer. Um, if we have a look at what's going on uh, in the title page, V's, double V's, or's, and continues, Thomas Hayward. Uh, abbreviations and names always important. And also we have the title, uh, the, um, the title piece there. Uh, again, same AA. It's the same AA. This is by the same guy. Uh, if we have a look at Faustus, uh, Christopher Marlowe, uh, well, look at the abbreviation. He's also clearly wearing a mask there. Okay, there's a V uh, on his chest. There's V's in his book. If you have a look at this beautiful thing here, which is the cross and the horned thing, uh, John Wright, uh, double V, we've seen some of these things. Anyone called John be sceptical about, basically. Um, yeah, so like, uh, if we have a look at Tamlin, Shepherds, and going back to Apollo, Sundry, and or, and, and, or, ah, uh, um, ah, uh, ra, ra, uh, it's all there, ro, ro, or, or, uh, Richard, uh, Jonas, John, Jonas, oh, and Robert Green. So we've got, we've got so many of these people that, um, <laughs> Many people have suspected to be in Shakespeare. Um, I believe our Shakespeare. Uh, Apollo, uh, say, tis a book, so hoping I shall find you. Uh, hoping, again, our anchor of hope. Uh, I love this, actually. Um, the Latin, Cero said, Celio, well, this refers to Clancares, uh, which was devised in 1545, um, so of this, this same century, which has your... Uh, sun in it, it it's all there um for those diligent readers who want to read a little deeper um yeah it's all there um master of the arts so is it any surprise um that the books that have most influenced shakespeare are most likely the ones that de Vere's either translated or written himself i think this is fairly obvious i think on the face of it this is the obvious thing like all it would seem that they have been written by him. Uh, and I should also point out that uh, Hollinshead um, uh, Chronicles, which is also um, quite been quite influential. If you, I, I mentioned in the last video about how um, he killed the undercook. Well, in the trial, well, it should be noted that Hollinshead was uh, William Cecil's, whose house Oxford spent a lot of time living in, uh, Davis spent a lot of time living in, uh, was actually at Oxford's trial, right, helping him get off um, the accusation of murder. So Holland's head is there, um, um, di directly related to this. So I wouldn't be surprised as well if De Vere has had a hand somewhere in there in translations. Now this is um, really important, so I'm going to read it. This is of historical poesy. Um, it's really important. These historical men, nevertheless, use not the matter so precisely to wish that all they wrote uh, should be accounted true, for that was not needful nor expedient to the purpose, namely to be used either for example or for pleasure, considering that many times it is seen a feigned matter or altogether fabulous, besides that it maketh more mirth than any other, works no less good conclusions, for example, than uh, the most true and veri uh, veritable, but oftentimes more because the poet hath the handling of them to fashion at his pleasure, uh, but not so of the other, which must go according to their verity and none otherwise without the writer's great blame. Again, as you know, more and more excellent examples may be feigned in one day by a good wit than many ages through man's frailty uh, are able to put in use, which made 
the learned and witty men of those times to devise many historical matters of no verity at all, but with purpose to do good and no hurt, uh, as using them for the manner of some discipline and president of commendable life. Such was the Commonwealth of Plato and Sir Thomas More's Utopia, resting all in device, but never put into execution. So Plato never put those devices, they're teaching through stories, but never put them into execution. Well, here is someone, if we go back to Ben Jonson's preface, this figure that thou seest put is someone that has put it into execution quite literally. Um, he is manipulating, fabricating um, history uh, for pleasure and for mirth and to not take praise, but to praise uh, and bring praise upon the English tongue to make our English tongue great um, and easier to be uh, wished for than to be performed. He has performed this and you shall perceive that histories were of three sorts, wholly true and wholly false and a third holding part of either, but for honest recreation and good example they were all of them. And this may be apparent to us not only by the poetical histories, but also by those that be written in prose. So not just in our poetical histories, um, but also in his prose. Um, history may not be telling the truth. It may not be accounted true. Um, the question is, though, are you really surprised that the world's greatest playwright likes to wear masks and play characters? Is that really that surprising? Um, if we just have a look at the last bit of Hamlet, which is his most autobiographical play, it's only the last bit I'm really going to look to, but I just want to alert you to the oars in Horatio and Fortinbras. Uh, there's lots of oars uh, in this, actually, lots of ands, sorrow, the word I love, fortune. Uh, well, all this he does truly uh, deliver. Uh, and let me speak to the yet unknowing world how these things came about. So you shall hear of carnal bloody and unnatural acts, of accidental judgments, casual slaughters, of deaths put on by cunning and forced cause, and in this upshot purposes mistook, fawn on the inventor's head. All this I can truly deliver, and indeed he does. Uh, he's the noblest to the audience, and he has some rights of memory in our kingdom. Uh, I love this. Come on. He's literally told you right there. OK, this all that I've been harping on about and the sceptics may not want to believe. He literally has told you right there, um, which are uh, row claim or claim my advantage doth invite me. Well, again, we've got lots of oars. Loads, 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 loads of oars and ands. Uh, they're all there. Um, the thing I really, and I love this, this wall, because you'll notice this R, it's just ever so slightly flicked up. You could argue that is R. All, his attention to detail um, is obsessive and genie, like, it, it, there's so much genius in what he is doing. Um, I wanted to alert you to this, though. Becomes the field, but here shows much amiss. He really did. Uh, become the field and much shows amiss. He has literally told you in one of the uh, last lines of one of the greatest ever plays what is going on. Go with the soldiers uh, shoot. Um, so just to kind of recap on some of our knights thus far, uh, who I believe and I invite scepticism, go away, research, I invite the academics of the world uh, please do some research, Like, look at this for yourself. You're only going to believe this if you can see this with your own eyes and do this with your own hands. So I invite you, be critical and go and see this. Uh, Philip Sidney, John Florio, Edmund Spencer, John Harrington, Richard Mulcaster, Henry Peach and John Gerard, who I mentioned in the first video, William Alexander, Thomas Nash, uh, Robert Green, Francis Bacon, John Dee, Christopher Marlowe, and continue and continue and continue. I'm saying um, there are a lot um, of potential uh, authors who De Vere is likely um, has either written under their names 
uh, some may be fabrication, but I'm not saying that these people didn't exist, although one or two might. I, I'd imagine that most of these people did exist, but the figure of uh, pragmatographia, uh, pragmatographia, um, the counterfeit action, he's writing under um, other people's names. And I'm also not saying that there weren't collab collaborations between um, these authors. I'm not saying that. Um, but I do believe that a lot of these works have De Vere's hand strongly behind them. I also think all of the authorship debate we've been having, this is ultimate divide and conquer um, to mislead people. Get like We're all fighting over the same thing here. Edward De Vere is behind all of the people that we've been seeing. So congratulations. I think you're all right. Uh, so well done. Um, so to those who wish to plough this field, uh, I should really suggest the title pages uh, to the reader, uh, dedicated poems, printing errors. Uh, and if there's any directions that he gives you to see or note things, I would suggest to go and check those out. I found a number of really interesting things, actually, uh, which I may tell you about. Um, some of the stage devices as outlined in the art of English posy. Read the art of English posy. I was not anyway interested in the authorship question until I accidentally found that book, accidentally found the author, and I've only found this because it, he's given me instructions within that to kind of understand uh, what's going on. Uh, who's printing, authoring uh, those names that he's been telling you, John, Thomas, Edward, Richard, etc. Uh, just be really savvy. Uh, about those names, or and Ra qualifying, as he calls them, I like to call them conceited ease, um, the, the double V's, the V's, references to art, nothing may, super important, desire, uh, Apollo, as we know now, is crucially important, sundry, phoenix, and verity and truth references. They're all uh, major things to flag as soon as you see those, uh, just pay attention to those. Uh, and I'm going to end... Uh, this video, as I think is right and proper, with um, Richard Field's uh, sign of the phoenix and say thank you very much um, for watching this. I have no idea. Uh, OK, we're over an hour again, so I'm very sorry. Thank you if you've paid attention to this. Um, and I hope in, may, in many ways uh, it may stimulate debate. Please do be critical. Uh, this is currently what I believe, uh, but please go away and research this uh, for yourself. I may at some stage, if you want me to, I can put some links uh, to uh, the books that I've been using so you can quickly go to those if that's helpful for you. Um, but just to say thank you to Edward De Vere for doing more for our English tongue and language than probably any author uh, has ever done uh, for, our, um, for our language. So thank you to that absolute genius, the ultimate English uh, Renaissance man, uh, who I hope uh, in years to come, may receive the recognition he rightfully deserves. So thank you very much um, and take care.